Oh, shit. Dude, this story is nuts, right? Huh? It is nuts. I really want to know when are you going to go back to like the conversation that they were having? I can do that now. Whatever, whatever you had planned for your flow. And I want to disrupt you. I can do the confrontation again because we stopped last time with Joey running. With Joey running. To the cabin. And trigger pulled. Trigger pulled. But there was a whole dialogue that you purposefully skipped. Yeah. The dialogue is extremely important. So where are you taking us? You taking us? to the... Well, tell me, like, what would be different in the dialogue? First, tell me what your thoughts are. Did this guy have a right to do what he did? I mean, so, okay, here's my perspective so far. The guy knew that he w- had been trespassing. He's had a couple of run-ins before. He purposefully was not following the rules, like, turning his, you know, camo inside out and shit. He's in the wrong. Trespassing is trespassing, and at the end of the day, you have the right to, to protect your your property. Um, and I think like that's legit. I do think though that there was a bit of an instigation on the group's front where like, all right, he was leaving, he was walking away. Did they really need to go con- have a confrontation with this person? Uh, because like I said, kind of similar to like a road rage scenario, you just don't know if what somebody is going to do and what's going to set somebody off to put them to the point of getting physical. And I always, always think about that when I'm in the car. I know you don't always think about that when you're in the car getting feisty with somebody on the road, but like that's happened once before and somebody lifted a gun up, you know, and a shirt. So, you know, like- I've gotten, that's happened twice to me. I know. So I, like the fact that you would also say like, oh, I would go after him and have a second talk. I would not because I don't, I think that only escalates the situation. I don't think that diffuses the situation. Personally, that's just how I handle things. Yeah, but hey, I, I mean, these kids all, these kids are just pulling out guns like they okay well if, this if, guy literally did pull out a gun yeah if someone pulls out a gun to me like that person is going to die like end of story I, I think like he was in the wrong because he um was on their property he did some things knowingly and the other guys like they could have let the situation go a bit or like not let it kind of get so heated but I cannot also understand because it was on their property obviously the retaliation by shooting people once he knew, knew that he, they had his tag number, you know, there's no justification for that. I get he didn't want to um, get in trouble, but so he's going to get in big trouble now. It's murder. Do, do you think he has any sway? If someone was, to, if there was one witness, do you think he could get out of it? Because he was confronted after he walked away. Yeah, but just because you're confronted, he's on their ter- he's on their property. All right, well, let me let me go back to the confrontation. Okay. All right, I'm a Joey Greco this shit up. Okay. This might change some things. So this is this is he's he this is before he walks away and flips them the bird. Yeah, the, before he walks away, this is what I'm going to read, and then he walks away. Okay. And then they come after him, and there's more confrontation. All right, I'm going to read this as it is. Who whose perspective is that from? From from his perspective. The shooter? Yeah. I'm going to go back, read this verbatim to what was said. So they saw this man in the tree stand, Joey Kratos tree stand. Bob, the property owner, half the property owner confronts him. All right. Were you on my son's tree stand? So you remember I said that. So I'm going back to there. Okay. The man says, yeah, I'm sorry. What the fuck were you doing on my son's tree stand? No answer. Do you think that fucker just grew there by itself? No answer. So now Bob Kratos is getting a little heated. Bob Kratos says, get Give me your name. This man says, I don't have to give you anything. He tries to walk away again. Joey, his son, then steps in front of this man, blocking his path. Okay. Yeah. And then Joey said the following, and this may change some things. Where the hell do you think you're going? You damn gook. You fucking chink. Get back here. Oh, I was not expecting that. Bob comes over. I'm sick of you humong assholes coming on my land. If you ever get caught out here again, I'll kick your Asian ass. Give me your name. Later in court, the guy's name is Vang, the shooter, Chai Vang. Vang later claimed the words, quote, you fucking chink. 
followed almost every one of his comments. Mm. Does that change anything? So this mm-hmm. guy, it was a hamong. Have you seen, you've seen that movie with uh, Clint Eastwood. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. his neighbors were the hamong people. Mm-hmm. They're from Laos. Yeah. 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 Great so movie. they're Laotian, but it's only 10% of Laos are hamong and they all live here in Wisconsin and there's very few of them, but they're obviously different looking than the Americans there. And these old timers think that they're of the Scary. same no, no. They think that they're the same descent of the country that Laos borders, which is Vietnamese. Ah, They okay. think they're Viet Cong. That's basically what it is. I'm going to get into it in a second. But not only the intimidation of them coming down there with ATVs, but now they're using racial slurs, the F word, calling him a fucking chink. And no one's disputing that. Plus, this isn't the first time a Hmong man out in the woods has gotten harassed and even beaten and left for dead. Oh, wow. Left for dead by by some random hunters, some white hunters. Wow. All right. We're going to talk about the Hmong. But does that make any difference at all? You know, I didn't think there was going to be anything that would make a difference. <laughs> but I got to say, it does. Like that, that those are those are words that would push anyone, I think, to their breaking point to say, fuck you right back. I don't know. Like, you know, it's hate speech. And uh, yeah, uh, the book says on the first page, a group of men suddenly emerged from the woods and surrounded Chai Vang. Big guys with angry, twisted faces. They shouted obscenities at him. Vang claimed that they called him a gook in a chink. Vang was confused, felt stripped of his dignity. It's kind of harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Putting myself into into Vang's shoes. Like, okay, gr- if it was an on- honest mistake. But there, I mean, I'm conflicted because there were a couple things going on. Like, he knew that he was in, well, did, we don't know exactly if he knew he was trespassing, but this was not his first time. He did know, but also which we'll talk about in a second, the Hmong people, where they're from, they don't have private property. A deer isn't confined to someone's invisible space saying their property. A deer roams the earth. The earth is everyone's. There's no private property among the Hmong. I get they're, that, but... And they're all immigrated, including Chai Vang, immigrated. Do you know the history of the Hmong? I only know it because of this story, and it's really fascinating. I don't. I, I like, just from what I remember, I think they got into it a little bit in that movie, right? Didn't they talk about it? it that movie was called, uh, it was the car. Gran Torino. Gran Torino. Yeah. So he fought, I believe, in World War II. No, Korea. Korea. And he had very uh, race prejudice yes. remarks to say to them. Mm-hmm. Did you want to add anything else before I tell you what the Hmong is? No, no, no. Because this shit will blow your mind. I didn't know this. No one knows this. The Hmong which is about 10% of Laos. Mm -hmm. And Laos, if you look at the map, Vietnam, Mm -hmm. Laos is connected to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So all the Hmong people were displaced. What happened in Vietnam? Like, what was that? What was that war about in Vietnam? Because this is really Uh, effing important right here. Fighting communism? Basically, yeah. Here's what nobody knows over here, but it's 100% true. And if you just look up a documentary about it, it it explains everything. But the reason the Hmong people are not not only here in America, but in Wisconsin is kind of like, what the fuck? Like, where, where do they come from? They, like they're like th- a very large portion immigrated yeah. to this particular spot in Wisconsin. Exactly. Interesting. And since they've been here, they've been uh, the target of racial hatred because of the Vietnam War. They look just like Vietnamese. I mean, they, their country mm-hmm. borders it. Mm-hmm. You can't tell them apart. But if you look at the the war of Vietnam, which was more of a military conflict, the Hmong people were actually fighting that war for Americans. Mm. Ameri- if you know about the Vietnam War, Americans did not want any part of that. Remember, they didn't want any part of that war. Well, they didn't want the to soldiers go over fighting there. it. Yeah, maybe. So here's here's what happened and why this is so important. Important because in Vietnam, the CIA was in charge of Vietnam first before we sent American soldiers. No one knows about this, but American soldiers, they couldn't get signed off. There had to be something big that happened before the U.S. gets pushed in there. Mm -hmm. So the CIA says, you know what? We have to stop Chinese communist expansion that is now making its way through Vietnam and will make its way through France and eventually make its way over here. Communist bad, democracy good. So the CIA goes to Laos Mm -hmm. and they contact the Hmong people, 10% 
Anderson of Laos who don't believe in communism and would fight back any communists. Huh. There's, there's only a small portion and they're the Hmong people. All right. Okay. The CIA, and this is all true, 100 percent. The CIA formed, quote, a secret army of these Hmong people. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they make up 10 percent of this uh, country, Laos. They were fighting against the Vietnamese, mostly the North Vietnamese, because that's the ones who were pushing communism. So first, America didn't get to Vietnam first. France got to Vietnam first and then we got to Vietnam. See, we don't know all that because no one knows about the secret war. If they would know the history and if it wasn't a secret war, then we would be more accepting of the Hmong people because they saved all of our lives, especially for downed pilots. These Hmong people, that was their area. They knew that terrain just as good as the North Vietnamese army did. So when an American pilot, which happened all the time, look at John McCain, when an American pilot gets shot down in the jungles of Vietnam, you have either two people who will, will come for you. The North Vietnamese army, which will put you in a torture camp like they did John McCain, are the Hmong people. And it's literally a 50-50 chance. Wow. The Hmong people will come, rescue you, take you back to the American camp. They basically won this whole conflict and no one knows that. Hmm. No one knows that they were fighting because wow. it was a secret army. Wow. Is that not insane to, to hear? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I never knew that. The Hmong lost 20% of their males. Wow. Their whole male population, 20% fighting that war. And they were in a secret army developed by the CIA, which is nuts, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, no nuts. one knows that part. Now, they first worked with France because France doesn't want communism either. And this was in the 50s. The Vietnam War actually spans earlier than the 60s. Mm -hmm. France got in it first. They went and they formed their own Hmong team because they knew that they would fight with them. However, there was a trade-off. France was trying to fight the Vietnamese, which is another communist organization. And the trade off was for the Hmong people, the only cash crop that they have in the jungles of Laos, of Laos was opium. That's all they had. So the trade off being they had to export this opium for the Hmong so their people can have some sort of income coming in. It's kind of a shady shit. Yep. When the Americans get there before the whole America knows about the Vietnam War, we're talking about the secret war. I mean, that's what they call it, the secret yep. war. The CIA agreed to about the same thing. They actually set up an airline, CIA chartered airline, Air America. They would drop ammo at the Hmong outpost and then pick up supplies of opium and drive and fly them out of the country. That is why the soldiers got addicted to heroin. That's why all the Vietnam veterans were addicted to heroin because that opium went to Saigon, was producing the heroin and then got back to to the soldiers. Wow. Now it's all coming together. You always hear CIA and drugs. You never believe it. This is proof. And it's, it's like, it's there, but you never hear it. No. You never hear about these people. But if you ever think about it, like, why the fuck are they here? Why are they here? And then we do what we did best in America is, you know, make all these relationships and everything's going good. And then we just pull the fuck out and let them all get overrun. Just like we did two years ago in Afghanistan. Exact same shit. We just pull all our shit out and all the Hmong get slaughtered. Some get displaced, the remainder of the Hmong, all that's left get displaced to different countries in America. We accept them and put them in the freaking woods of Wisconsin where they can't talk to fucking anybody. That's basically how it is. Is that not the most craziest shit you ever fucking heard? That is crazy. Thank you for the history lesson. The, the Hmong people are extremely respected among people that knew they were fighting with the Americans. But guess what? All these old timers in effing rural Wisconsin, they don't know this. Yeah. They just think that they're the Viet Cong that we just sent all our boys over there to die for. They look the same. They talk the same. They're the same height. They don't because this is a secret war. I didn't know this shit. You didn't know it. How do we expect Bob Croteau well, not to know this is some freaking chink, as he thinks? This well, guy saved, still. this guy was, th these Hmong lost 20% of their males saving American pilots. I mean, so some of the war stories are fucking intense. There's like American pilots talking about it, that the Hmong will come and a group of 12 be overrun, lose all of their men, but like three in one little battle, but then they will drag the pilot away to safety. I mean, there's just the most incredible 
fearless people and we fucked them over like we always do. We we had this whole thing going and then we just freaking bolted. I mean, it, it would have been I mean, uh, like either way, w- no matter what nationality or origin they came from, like it, w- he, it even if they, he was Vietnamese versus Hmong, like it's still a, I would still be pissed. It's a racial slur. It's hate. You know what yeah, I mean? Like it, would it would he even use hateful speech if he if if he knew? It, it, no, if we looked at these guys like heroes because they were fighting with the Americans, but no one knew about it. But they were losing all of their men. Boys 10, 11 and 12 mm. were foot soldiers for the Hmong. 10, 11 and 12, including the shooter today. The shooter's father was a second lieutenant in Vietnam. He is in Laos mm-hmm. right across. Literally, he was in, in when he was eight years old. He was saying when he was playing with sticks and, you know, playing war soldier, boo, 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 boo. Mm-hmm. He could hear his dad shooting real communists over the mountain. Yeah. Like they grew up in war, you know? Yeah. That's why he's such a good shot. Well, it is interesting. Like if you know. think about the time, this was in 2004. So the age of like a Bob, you know, or, or like, yeah. you know, that's where he was probably a little bit more impacted by the Vietnam War in some way, shape or form. He would have been too young, I'm, I'm assuming, to have been like capable of going over there. But I mean, I so it's like either way, no matter what, I think it would have triggered anybody, even if no matter what nationality, if you're being called a racial slur, like if I was or if I was being called like something for being a female or something, someone was calling me like a, you know, something a Jewish slur, for example. Yeah. Um, or if you were called, for example, a Jewish slur, even if you weren't Jewish, you would still be like, what the fuck? Like, it still would get you upset. And then it's like magnified by the fact that. Yeah, but these guys are here. So, I know right. it's like it makes it it magnifies it. Let's say let's say the American soldiers come back and they're, they're considered heroes. Right. Which is pretty much how it is. What if well, like, let's say I'm a hero. I come back and instead of being treated like a hero, they call me some communist or some baby killer. It's like the same fucking thing it's like dude i i that makes sense i was risking my life saving americans right like and fighting against the people that you, the, the slurs that they and this isn't calling. hearsay yeah. just type in on youtube there are some there are many american pilots that have i mean that give their whole life to the Hmong. literally i mean these guys save them that's crazy and it was mostly the pilots because everyone would see the pilot coming down his parachute shh Ooh, crash landing. They'd hear a plane crash. You had the North Vietnamese army trekking through the woods. And then you had the Hmong people, some as young as 10, who could barely hold an AK-47, trekking through the woods to save that pilot. For the American, for yeah, us, for our crazy. soldiers. Like, we would have lost a ton more soldiers if, you know, and the fact that they come over here now, maybe not expecting to be treated like heroes, but at least not called a chink or a gook, you know, yeah. because they've, like, served with us. Now it's just like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah, totally, totally. It's... But it's a secret war, so no one knows that. And I'm out anyone on live chat knew that because i didn't fucking know that yeah yeah holy shit that just blew my effing mind dude yeah oh my god so put it so again like going back to that conversation and confrontation that changes things yeah because he he immigrated from there when he was like eight yeah you know and not only that chai vang served in the army national guard oh wow in california yeah he served so he's an american soldier I don't know, man. Yeah, that uh, that's like that's seriously adding some insult to injury. Like yeah. I don't know, that's that's. Uh. So anyway, I mean, now I'm not gonna lead you guys astray. This is murder. He could have. He could. He's gonna kill others here. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's still murder. I would, I would, but I, he was I'm a little bit more on like, maybe it's, what's it? What, is it manslaughter? And perhaps no, this would be murder at this point, but it's like, it's a fit of rage. It's a reaction. Well, so here's the one saving grace. Can he prove? Cause there's one shot that gets fired from that rifle that Willers was carrying one shot. This is a chicken and egg. If that shot was first, then it's self-defense, then it's self-defense. He could have killed every one of those people, even the people that came up because he didn't know. Sure. He, he doesn't know. Who are these people? The Hmong people, this isn't the first time that they've been beaten and they knew that this guy was Hmong. Well, they didn't. They did because he was short and they could see, you know, 
his ski mask, they could see his dark complexion. They knew he was Asian. They followed him over there because the Hmong people are the ones that keep trespassing because they don't believe in private property. Mm -hmm. That's why they wanted to put a stop to it. That's why Bob Kruto went over there to teach his Asian ass not to come over there. In their, granted, he didn't, in their thinking, yeah. Granted, he didn't bring his rifles, but he did bring four other people, five other people. Yeah, yeah. You know, so and now I'm not sticking up for this guy. You're going to see this gets worse. I mean, he could have stopped, but I think you'll see that all this, this story is fucking nuts, man. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know what well, you want to keep going. <laughs> keep it going. Did that change like a lot of yeah, shit or not? Yeah. Oh yeah, it did. Keep it going though. All right. Fuck it. Last episode, I start with Joey. Joey Croteau, he was the son of the property owner. He's on his way back to camp. He's running full speed. However, just like his dad, his orange vest, his orange jacket is going to betray him. Anyway, Joey, considered a fast runner, he is trekking back towards that cabin. But Chai Vang sees his orange jacket, his blaze orange jacket, and he, using his knowledge of the terrain and how to navigate, he anticipates his, this guy's movement. So he goes up a hill a little bit, kind of to cut him off. When this guy is running, now Chai Vang is kind of on an elevated platform Mm -hmm. looking down at his rifle waiting for this guy to basically run out right in front of him. He's only 200 feet away at this point. And this guy is a sharpshooter, like I said. Chai Vang raises his rifle and he pulls the trigger. The first shot goes into his lower back. And this is the son, Joey. Yep. Joey hit the ground hard, his knees denting the soil and his radio tumbling from his pocket. As Joey gathered his strength and struggled to his feet, Vang reloaded and shot twice. The first missing, the second striking him in the back. Stumbling forward, Joey began screaming, help me, help me, help, help. This is nuts, man. Yeah, is. Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? All right. Since Joey was so close to the cabin, the others, which is a whole mess of them. There's about eight people at the cabin. And if I mess any names up, if if like, for instance, one of the family members hears this, it's a lot of people and I'm doing my best, but I think I got everyone pretty straight. Right. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so. Joey is right by the cabin. So family members at the cabin hear these cries for help. Now they're going to jump on their ATVs and go see what's going on. Joey starts stumbling. Help, help me, help, help. I mean, he's still 200 feet away from the cabin. They can't hear him. They can't hear his cries, right? The last bullet hit Joey's neck, traveled at an upward angle and into his brain, killing him. Wow. As Vang stepped closer, he could hear Joey's death groans. All right, Joey's dead. Now, at this point, Vang is going to go back to his hunting party because he was there with other Hmong people and he got lost, apparently. So he's going to try to go back Back to his own camp, not knowing that he left survivors there. You know, he thought they would die off. Yep. So this man, Chai Vang, is on the way back to his camp now when he hears a faint, help, help, help us. Someone is around those ATVs around where that massacre just happened saying, help, help on the radio, Ooh. trying to call out. All right. He hears that. So he runs back towards that, that crime scene, you know, to finish them off. So at this point, he's only got six rounds left. He fired 10. He has a 10 round clip and he reloads another six. And that's his last six. He's got at least killed those people. And if he can kill those people, he could walk away free. Because he could say any, he could say this and no one is there to dispute it. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, but the one thing he needs is that rifle that Terry Willers is carrying. If that man's still alive, and he is because he's calling on the radio, he needs that rifle to fire a shot. Just one, and that's all that matters. But that would make it where he could say, oh, they fired at me first. But as of now, that rifle has not gone off. Does that okay. make sense? It would, it would make the case more ironclad for him. Because everyone around here knows that these people are mistreated. Like that's n- not in question. That call for help that Vang heard on his way back was from Lauren, the yep. Lauren Hesbeck, mm-hmm. the, the only one that could really walk around. And so Vang goes back to, to take care of him. Let me talk really quick about his background. I'm going to go through it real quick. Chai Vang's background. Okay. All right. I told you about the Hmong people. His background is a follows really quick. His father, like I said, was a second lieutenant. He was the first, Chai Vang was the first son, second child of six. He immigrated here in 1980. His first wife was arranged. That was when he was 16. There was some domestic abuse 
issues that was reported. They didn't get along at all, and they fought constantly. Not long after their marriage, while Vang worked his morning paper route, they got into a fight and he pushed her. She reported this to Vang's father when his dad attempted to physically discipline him. Vang despondently ran away from home and thought of killing himself. So he's 16 at the time. Vang's father, the second lieutenant who's now immigrated to America, was really strict, disciplinarian, on the verge of abusive to his children. Chai Vang was suspended at least twice for fighting in school. So this all goes into his character, right? Yeah. And a lot of this isn't presented in court. I'm just trying to get you to see what you would do. Mm -hmm. In school, he joined the drill and rifle team. He became a sharpshooter and later joined the National Guard in California. He even became a shaman for the Hmong people. Remember, there's this very small population here of Hmong people. He became a registered shaman, trained shaman, because, quote, the spirits called him. And he would actually get paid to heal other Hmong people and to drive demons out of them, absorb the demons, and then kind of wash the demons away from his body. Mm -hmm. Like It's whatever they believe, right? And he got paid for this just not very much, right? I mean, okay. They don't have much money. Chai Vang is going to have three wives. And the author of this book just labels them wife one, wife two, wife three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wife one felt Vang acted different, differently after he became a shaman, more aware of his surroundings and more cautious about life. But at the same time, he got angry faster. If he didn't get his way, he yelled. Wife one and him ended up splitting. They did have children. And once at a dinner party, since they hated each other, wife one brings out a birth certificate of one of his children at a dinner party with all his friends, puts it on the table. It has another man's name on it for his kid. So that's fucked up. At that point, he takes out a gun and puts it to wife one's forehead. And that's when he gets his first felony assault. Oh, yeah. Their eldest daughter stepped between them. She said, I've never seen him this way. Like he wasn't my dad at all. That is something I that I had never seen in him. So he goes through the next two wives extremely fast. He gets a job as a truck driver and he's working long hours. He does pick up a second wife. She's she's crazy showing up at his work with a gun, threatening him and stuff. They only lasted a year. He gets remarried to, to a wife three, which I don't even know her name. It's not even in the book crazy. to wife three. But at this point, He's working two jobs, which he's not supposed to be because he's a truck driver and he's working another job. I think you're only supposed to work 11 hours if you're a truck driver, but he's working 16 to 18 hours a day at this point. Jeez. And he's away from home and... At this time, he is getting in trouble a lot. In 2002, he got arrested the first time for trespassing when hunting. He he also, and this is a constant theme within this culture because they don't believe in, t in property rights. They think the earth is for everyone. A deer doesn't stick in between public property. He goes wherever the hell he wants, you know. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand it. That's why they keep breaking the rules. But they do know that they're breaking our rules. Right. You know what I'm saying? In the next two years, after 2002, he gets arrested for more trespassing and and he gets the last wife. He fathers at least at least 10 children and even had a mistress in California who eventually sued him for child support. So now he's actually paying alimony. He's working 16 to 18 hours a day and he is getting called, you know, he's getting mistreated like all the Hmong. That's where he's at so far. And this is right up to the murder. He's he's got a short fuse and he's yeah. he's got some problems. Yeah, he's on his he's on his last, uh, you know. Yeah. Wife three says, quote, we're barely making it. At times, he would say he didn't know what to do because there is no way he can work so much to take care of all the bills. She worried that Vang had become exhausted and depressed. He always looked kind of low. He doesn't get excited about things much, she said. So that's a little bit about him. Quick. And, and you know now he stresses shit and you know what happens now. They call him these names and he just says, you know what, motherfuckers, I am done with this. You know, I am yep. fucking sick of this shit. And that's basically what happened. Now, I want to run through um, the murder day right quick because there's some other people that get it. On this murder day, November 21st, he leaves work at 1.30 a.m. in the morning. This is in 2004. He meets up with friends, the Hmong people. They have their hunting party. They get around this area, not on private property, but in their own separate camp. And they set up camp. And at 5.30, a friend wakes him up so they can all go hunting. He gets displaced 
erased from his friends and lost. He does not have a compass. So he, and that's his fault. He should carry a compass, right? Yeah. One friend says that Vang had a bad dream that night and his friend woke him up. He said that he was in the jungle of Laos, surrounded by North Vietnamese communist soldiers, but fought his way out only to be surrounded again by more soldiers, tanks, and armored vehicles. As he was about to be captured, his friend Tai woke him up. So going back to, he's going back to the camp to finish off Lore and Hesbeck. Yeah. I'm gonna, let's go through this kind of quick. At this point, he's camouflaged. He's going to go kill this guy who he thought he killed earlier, right? And Hesbeck doesn't see him coming. So he goes back to the camp and he sees Hesbeck calling on the radio for help. He also hears the ATVs coming from other people that are coming to see what the situation is. At that camp, there's a Jessica Willers, a female, the daughter of the one that was shot first, yep. Harry Willers. Mm -hmm. She is also a registered nurse. She gets on the ATV against the advice of everyone else in the camp to go save her father. She's unarmed. She's with another guy on this ATV. Uh, his name is Lasky, Al Lasky. They get on the ATV and they go out towards where their father father is. All right. Mm -hmm. At this point, they're going to come in contact with Chai Vang, who doesn't know who these people are at this point. So he's going to take care of them as their witnesses. So Vang would say later in court that he was afraid that these were just more posse coming to kill him. So the ATV that Jessica was on was barreling towards him, shooting at an upward angle. The first bullet Chai Vang shot, shot, struck Jessica in her left buttock, exited through her hip and with her her legs drawn up and her body leaning forward, passed through a fold in her belly and exited her body with plenty of velocity left. All right. She is on an ATV riding at this point. So he is hitting a moving target. He actually, that one bullet shoots both her and the passenger, mm. an Al Lasky, Jeez. who was chauffeuring Jessica. That bullet exited through Jessica's belly and into Lasky, La Al Lasky's body. It says the now deformed bullet rammed into the middle of Lasky's back, severed his spinal column, passed through his abdomen and exited his body, leaving him paralyzed from from the waist down, Jessica immediately fell off. Lasky, just like Mark Royd we were talking about, was on the ATV, still on the handlebars. This guy who was just transporting Jessica to save her father, they had no weapons whatsoever, were riding this ATV. This guy is on the front, Jessica is behind him. Now they're both shot. The bullet goes to Jessica with enough velocity to also paralyze him. He's holding on to the handlebars. Jessica fell off and he is just kind of riding it Jesus. completely paralyzed in his nuts man lasky hanging on to the handlebars remained aboard for a split second Vang quickly shot again. The bullet struck and lodged in Lasky's right buttock and tumbled off, but he never felt it. The ATV continued to coast. Neither victim was dead at this point. Lasky was face down and so was Jessica. Vang jumped up ran to Lasky, stood behind him and shot again, leaving a shell casing on the trail. The bullet hit Lasky, Lasky's left mid back at a sharp upward angle. So he's right behind him. The guy's crawling away on his back or not even crawling. He's paralyzed. He's just laying there. Vang comes up behind him and shoots choom, just right through the back to the brain. Boom. He's dead. Jeez. Jessica is the only one still alive at this point. Quote, Jessica crawled on two hands and one knee, dragging her left leg, smearing her right knee with a heavy mud smudge a distance of 20 feet down the trail she crawls 20 feet going back away from the shooter back towards the cabin just crawling to get out of the line of sight 20 feet spreading her her blood all on the trail 20 feet quote pleading shouting screaming jesus her large shock of blonde hair and high-pitched voice, unmistakable, identified her as a woman. Vang stepped behind her and shot into her upper back. The bullet passed a moder moderately sharp upward angle through her neck into her brain, killing her. Jesus. So here, and let me show you all the victims here. The victims are as follows. Danny Drew ends up dying. Joey Croteau ends up dying. Al Lasky, the one that I just talked about. Bob Croteau ends up dying. Mark Royt and Jessica Willers. These are the victims right here. And you see the tree stand. That's that. That's the whole thing. That's why this murder happened. This mm -hmm. fucking tree stand, right? That's it. You see 
the female nurse, she just went out to save her father. Yeah. And her father's not even dead. Yeah. Her father's not on here. Her Lives. father lived. I mean, think about that. It's hard. Your daughter went out to save you and now she's dead. If she wouldn't have went out, she would have been fine. She would have just been at the cabin. Everyone else at the cabin was fine. He was just shot. In fact, right here it says uh, wounded but survived. Lauren Hesbeck, Terry Willers, the two, the t- only two survivors that were shot and yeah. still survived. When Vang got back, he sees Lauren Hesbeck trying to radio help to DNR and everything else. They become eye locked at this point. They both have a weapon. Vang now goes to kill Lauren Hesbeck and they lock eyes with each other. Vang up on an embankment looks down. They're locking eyes and he says, the following because Hespec survived. Quote, you not dead yet? Now, Vang would say he never said this, but you know, that's how. Interesting. Yeah. Unable to lift his left arm, Hespec slithered the white rifle along his body, balanced it on top of a mound, and pointed it right at Vang. And he had he had a perfect shot right at Vang. And I mean, he had it on this mound, so he was looking right at the shooter, and he was going to shoot him. Boom! He's going to take care of everything. And he aims as Vang is trying to get to cover, and he gets a perfect shot. Click! The safety's on. It didn't go off because the fucking safety's on. Oh my god. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> shit. That was it. Terrified, he had to retaliate to stop Bang from shooting him. He slipped the rifle back to the top of the mound and doing something he never thought he would do, shot at another human being. Now, that is important because that's the one shot that came out of that rifle the whole time, which now Vang, when he gets to court, is going to say they shot first. And there's really no way to prove it. All they know is that both rifles shot. They You can't tell with ballistics who shot first. There's no way you can't. There's no time signature on them. No, but like when where he where he was like the location of the bullet that shot at Vang was at a different spot than the confrontation area. No, it was about at the same spot. Yeah. And plus and plus here's a big one. That bullet was never found. The the law enforcement calmed that area over and over and over. That bullet was never found. They had everything, but they knew it fired. They knew that rifle fired fired and Vang was saying it shot first is a tricky situation because it's not just his word against his word it's it is his word against the whole Hmong people you know what I'm saying like this is their whole thing are they going to stand with Chai Vang and and mm. and say that he did the right thing or, or you know what I'm saying is this going to cause some kind of race outbreak you know what what is going to happen like this is a whole people this isn't just it's 100 not just this just person yeah yeah if this was just 100 going crazy and killing just as many people no one would know but since this is like now a race prejudice thing you know it's crying nuts man yeah it is now this is where it gets interesting Hespec shoots misses obviously Vang gets up points his rifle at Hespec Hespec is now pointing his rifle back at Vang what Hespec doesn't know is Chai Vang is out of ammunition Ooh. so it is just is just like in the movie where they're pointing the guns at each other and you know they don't have ammunition type of shit, but neither one of them knows what's going on. Carefully, Hespec raised his head above the mound to survey Vang's movements. He did not want to be surprised again. Then he saw Vang holding his rifle in a shooting position. He doesn't have ammo, but Hespec doesn't know that. A- an attempt to intimidate Hespec. At this point, their eyes meet and Vang charges towards this man like they're going to battle in some kind of crazy bayonet war or some shit. <laughs> He's charging towards this man. Their eyes meet. Neither move. Vang has had the ability to shoot, but not the bullets. Hespec had the bullets, but not the ability. It was a standoff. After another pause, a uh, vein charges forward as Hespec feared. But then he hears a diesel engine coming down the road, another ATV. So that fight never happened. Vang books runs. it. Yeah, runs away. That was a lot. Good job. Good job. You can do it. I mean, I think that's it. No, what happened? Well, what happened at the end? What do you want? It- well, what do you think happened? Yeah, I told you everything. I think he was convicted of murder versus self-defense. All right, let's let's take a look at it real quick. Let's take a look at okay. it. What, what do we know? We know that... He was trespassing. He was trespassing. He's got a history of um, trespassing and a, he's got a felony. We know that these hunters confronted him. He left and then they confronted him again. We know he's scared. He doesn't know what's going to happen. We also know that he has to kill all the witnesses. And the only one he didn't kill because he ran out of ammo was Lauren Hesbeck. The only the only real witness there and the, the people that were there. Mm-hmm. It's the only one. Right. And, te- and Terry Willers. 
he lived too. So two. Yeah. If he would have killed both of those, there would have been no question. He would have walked free. He would have just said that they fired first. Well, could he have if it, I don't know if he would have been able to if um because there's a history of these Hmong people getting getting beat and abused by these Wisconsinites in the yeah. yeah. This isn't as the long first as time. as long as a shot was fired, he would have been able to say that yeah. from the other guy's gun. Yeah. But even he could have got away because this guy's he's an army soldier, National yeah. Guard. You know, so even if he would have said, which is the truth, oh, Joey stood in front of me, blocked my path. That right there is a threat. Mm -hmm. If someone blocks my path, that is just the same as pulling a gun out on me. You know, if you're going to restrict my movements, that is you might as well just hit me. Yeah. You know, he could use that anyway. That's what he could have used. And plus the the racial things, which no one's denying. Mm -hmm. So any of that sway your decision? I mean, it definitely it, it does in like I think that would easily get to someone's breaking point and and that would be a hot button. Obviously, he took it to like he took it further than he should have or needed to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Here's what he did wrong. Here's what everyone does wrong. You fucking talk. If you get arrested, which he did, they found him on the trail and he was pretending that he was just some lost person. They apprehend him. He talks. Mm -hmm. He goes through four different variations of his story. That's a problem. That's a problem. You, if you get arrested, I don't care what for, you get an attorney immediately. You ask for a lawyer. Okay. If he had a lawyer initially who told him to shut up, he would have walked free, but he changed his story. The first one being some crazy one I can't even recall. It was something like he didn't fire a shot. He's innocent. Uh, Bob Curteau took his rifle and shot everyone and then shot himself. It was some crazy shit like that. That was the first variation. Mm. The second variation was more to the truth, but it was a lot of the racial things and, and they fired first. The bullet, the chicken or the egg type of thing. Third variation, his lawyers told him not to talk, any, talk to anybody, but he reached out to the Chicago Tribune and ran a third variation, which was different. Then in court, he testified against his lawyer's uh, wishes against his yeah. yeah against his lawyer's recommendations he testified on his own behalf a fourth variation in the very end of the book he is handed six life sentences without parole wow. however reading the whole book you'll see the jury w which was later approached and the jury the jury foreman was the only one who would come forward and you know say what you know, why they chose this decision of guilty life without parole and he says the thing that did it for him was he changed his story. That's the thing that did it for him. The foreman of the jury. Wow. If that guy would have just shut up and let his lawyers take care of it, he would walk free. And I honestly, I mean, I I do honestly believe that these were some racial hate slurs. And I do think they were threatening him. And I do think he took it too far. But I do also think that he was, he didn't know. He didn't know who was coming. He didn't know who had a handgun. He yeah. didn't know who was coming to kill him. I mean, he is, you know, yeah. they're out there in Wisconsin in the woods. He's by himself. If he would have just been quiet, he would have walked, mm. but he didn't. That's really interesting. But now, you know, he's life in prison without parole it's for the six murders of, you know, these people. Wow. So I don't know. It's a crazy story. That was a crazy story. It's a, it's a crazy story, man. And yeah. you know what? Honestly, out of everything... Even going back to try to kill Lauren Hesper, uh, Hesbeck, I would have been fine with him walking. But the fact that he killed Jessica, who was just going to help her dad. I mean, I don't know, man. She was unarmed. She was crawling away and he shot her point blank in the back of the skull. Yeah. Like at that point, man, you, and two two of them, same thing, shot him right in the yeah. back of the skull. While they, they weren't were, a part of. They, they, they were no longer a threat. So I believe that in itself is murder. Mm. Because as a soldier, if I shot someone in the back and they are crawling, all I have to do is go check them for weapons, the first thing, and then hog tie them. You know, I don't even have to treat their bandage. If they bleed out, then whatever. I did my part. But to to take their life at this point, I, I think is murder. Yeah, he did it. He did it so that no one would know. Like he, he yeah. should try to cover his tracks. He tried to cover his tracks because his thought was he was going to kill everyone, run back to the Hmong camp, not talk about it again, and perhaps even got away with it. Yeah, he he would dump his rifle and everything else, and I mean he could possibly got away with it, and it could possibly be an unsolved freaking thing. Yeah, you know. Crazy. Fucking that nuts, is crazy. Man. You know, I don't think it, the story's ever going to get big, but I think the author did a wonderful job. He 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 was interested in it because he heard all the sirens and everything else. Mm. And and he said, I think he read like 1600 pages of court reporting and interviewed like pretty much everyone. And it is a little biased 
towards like obviously he's a murderer i mean which oh, he, it, which yeah. he is but you know like he puts into doubt that they called him racial slurs and stuff like that but i don't know man i know them i know them country folk dude i know exactly that's what they did yeah. you know or it wouldn't put it past you the good old boys yeah anyway i hope you guys like that i don't know if anyone's still on here my computer died but i didn't I wasn't even going to think about recording today man because we've been sick as shit well you did great now you can go rest anyway that's all i have so we'll be on the discord the reason I wasn't on all week because I was sick as a dog. But now I'm better, getting better. So anyway. You sound a lot better today. You're still it, sick, but you sound a lot better. All right. Thank you so much for sticking with me. This has been this has been kind of like it's been uh, a journey. Been a journey. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You just being here is like the best thing ever. But until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely, lovely hunters. 